Welcome to the newest episode of Beatin' and Bangin'. I'm your host, Kyle Dalton. We've got a lot to cover in today's video from the weekend in Phoenix, including an impressive day by the Toyotas, which had been shut out in stage wins and victory lane in the previous three races, but showed up in mass in the desert. And Christopher Bell finishing it off with his first win in 2024. However, before we talk about the race, let's go back to Friday and remarks from the drivers after the rare 50-minute practice about how the car handled in traffic with a new short track rules package. Let's just say it wasn't flattering, as Jeff Gluck reported. Very bad, exponentially worse, and terrible aren't what NASCAR had in mind. But here's a strange twist of events. Kevin Harvick, who turned competitive laps for the last time in his illustrious Hall of Fame career just four months ago on the mile-long track, where he dominated and won nine times in his career, no longer views racing from the driver's seat. He views it from the broadcast booth, but more importantly, as a fan. Here's what he had to say. Well, I think anytime there is change and you can do things different and everybody's got some unknowns, it kind of just mixes everything up. And I listened to a lot of people frustrated yesterday is not necessarily a bad thing for us to watch in the race. Heck no, great thing. Harvick's remarks were during the qualifying session on Saturday. Drivers also met with reporters around that same time, and there were a couple of notable moments, both involving Kyle Busch. The first occurred when the two-time champion was inside the media center off-camera with Kyle Larson on stage answering a question. The two had a brief exchange that ended like this. Um, <laughs> I think their pick who should have held the sign a little stronger, so maybe it didn't slide through and come over the line. Yikes. Kyle on Kyle crime. Funny stuff. Bush took center stage a few minutes later and unsurprisingly much of his time was dedicated to discussing his pit crew issues and the changes the number eight team made before the race, calling up a couple of pit crew guys from the Xfinity series side. Bush made one point that I thought was really interesting and don't ever really hear talked about, but it's clearly something he cares about and wishes Richard Childress might even offer him a bonus for. Take a listen. I mean, there's probably five or six different sectors of pit road of, of things that you worry about to make sure that you're the best at all of those. And, you know, one of those is getting onto pit road, how you roll your pit road speed with your lights, how you get into the box, how you get out of the box, how you exit pit road, get back up on the racetrack and blend. And so all of those things, you want to be perfect every time. I'm already number one on pit road all the time. So like, I'm trying to just build my gap of how close I am to that line, you know, like the last five years or whatever. Um, Denny loves statistics. Ask him who number one on pit road's been, you know? So, uh, I take pride in that each and every year. I mean, it doesn't really do you a whole lot, but, um, you know, some teams give bonuses for that. I don't get bonuses for it, but, uh, some teams give that. I think 2311 actually does. So I don't think any of those guys are getting any. For me, I love hearing stories like this because it shows just how much this is such a team sport. And like football, if one unit isn't working, it can cost your team a win or at least a good finish. And when one of the units tries to help overcome the deficiency of another unit, it can prove disastrous. Interesting stuff. Also on Saturday was the Xfinity Series race, which Justin Allgaier led late and appeared destined for victory but had a tire issue late, and Chandler Smith won. I wasn't going to say anything about the Fox broadcast with Adam Alexander out of town due to a death in the family but it would be negligent of me to not discuss the final memory for those watching the broadcast. Now remember, Chandler Smith won. What an exciting day it was for Joey Logano, Daniel Suarez, Regan Smith, Josh Sims, and our entire Fox Sports team. I'm Jamie Little. Thanks so much for being with us today. Congratulations, Justin Allgaier. Moving on to Sunday, and not quite yet, to the cup race, but to moments before and the command to fire engines. Watch this. Phoenix, Arizona, are you ready? Driver, start your engine! Well done. After all the driver feedback, plus what Kevin Harvick and Clint Boyer had to say in qualifying, I was looking to see what kind of action there was going to be when the green flag waved. It started slowly as Ty Gibbs pulled out front from his second position 
and led the first 57 laps before Tyler Reddick overtook the number 54 car to take the stage win, the first for Toyota in 2024. Stage two action picked up. In the first 30 laps, Martin Truex Jr. moved up from 13th to 6th, Kyle Larson from 32nd to 20th, and Christopher Bell also moved up five spots. In other words, there was plenty of passing if you had a good car. The second segment ran caution-free until the stage conclusion, which saw Christopher Bell charge through the field and claim the second stage win for the Toyotas on the season. Notice a trend here? But as has become an unfortunate theme for that same manufacturer and its various teams, pit road can be and often is problematic. Everyone said last week that Las Vegas was the first true test of the pit crews because it wasn't a super speedway where pit crew involvement is limited. Everyone was saying how the pit road at Phoenix was going to be just as difficult. The post-race penalty report had a single speeding on pit road all day, and it was by Harrison Burton. It was really a non-issue as far as teams making costly mistakes, but there was one moment during the stage two pit cycle that Christopher Bell fans will remember. It started in what has become an all too familiar site for the 20 team in the last few years. Bungled pit stops for any number of reasons, including one in the 2022 championship at the same track, where one crew member got his finger stuck between the wheel and the plate, which naturally caused a delay in the stop and ended any chances at the title. It appeared to happen again when rear tire changer Michael Hicks stayed longer on the right rear of the car, his action adding at least a second to the stop. Bell was understandably frustrated after the stop. Moments later, to Fox's credit, they interviewed Hicks. So uh, the wheel didn't make it over the drive pins and it was kind of stuck. So I had to stay on the lug nut just to ensure and watch that the back of the wheel made it to the back plate. So just that's what, you know, sometimes you gotta, you gotta stay there longer to make sure the wheel's tight and that's what I had to do. What I love about that interview is this. A, he was direct in providing an informative answer to what happened, which earned him high praise from Kevin Harvick moments after. And B, I interviewed Hicks first. I did it last year. Check it out. I have preached it on this channel and I'll continue doing so. This is a team sport. The pit crews are just as critical to a team's success as the driver and the crew chief. Just ask Kyle Busch. If you think about it, what Hicks did in that moment likely proved to be the difference between victory and defeat for the number 20 team. Because if he doesn't get that wheel tight, they're looking worst case, losing it on the track like Chris Buescher did last week and having a couple of pit guys, Hicks and one other suspended, or best case, having to make a return trip to pit road, losing valuable track position and making it an incredibly steep uphill climb to win. Instead, Hicks makes that call, which at the time looked bad because it added a second or so to the stop, but in the end proved to be a winning decision. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, or something like that. One thing that Hicks's remarks reminded me of is will issues. I feel like this year, through four races, there has been a disproportionate amount of wheel trouble. Last week, Bubba Wallace's team got a lug nut on so tight and couldn't get it off until they cut it off. The aforementioned Busher lost a right wheel and slammed violently into the outside wall. Then this week, we have the issue for the 20 car. Overall, last year, the wheel issues were minimal, especially compared to the first year of the next-gen car. That drop in wheel mishaps was to be expected with an additional year of experience. But it sure seems like we've seen a notable uptick early in 2024. Maybe it's just the beginning of the year rust and it'll improve in the coming weeks. I'm certainly going to keep an eye on it to see what happens. In that third stage, there were a couple of things of note. The first being the impressive and aggressive driving of Noah Gregson on multiple restarts. It was clearly visible even to the casual fan to see the number 10 flashing up to the outside, sometimes going four wide to pass in the corners, and he did it on multiple occasions, gaining valuable track position. He ran inside the top 10 for most of the day, and only in the final laps got passed, finishing 12th. That's two top 10s and a 12th in three of the first four races. You wouldn't get many who would argue that he's the top Stuart Haas racing driver just four races in. 
I know I sure didn't have this on my bingo card. Ty Gibbs also did something of note in that final stage and completely went against the advice of Kevin Harvick from his Happy Hour podcast last week. When the former driver turned Fox broadcaster gave the 21-year-old JGR driver guidance on his in-car actions. He was frustrated with his teammate this weekend on, on the radio with, with Martin Truex right. and, and the way that they were jerking those cars around. And, and you, could, you could visually see the frustration with the maneuvers that they were doing with the car and the radio backed that up. I have a gun. Raise it up. Easy. That's it. He's got the speed, and I think if he can just stay off the radio i think it would do him a lot of favors if he could just eat, learn how to yell at himself <laughs> uh, i think that would that would go a long ways with with him because then he wouldn't have to answer all the questions during the week about something that he said and here we are talking about him again why because there was a point in stage three that the jgr driver and defending cup series champion ryan blaney got into it on the track take a listen to the exchange That wasn't on you. He got himself in a bad spot. You were the first one he can get to, so ignore it. Yeah, just tell him if that happens, he'll get the same, the same payment. Yeah, just gotta brush that off. There's some irony here because Blaney is notorious for keying up his radio and letting his frustration and four letter words fly in the direction of his competitors. The difference is he's a veteran with race wins and a championship. He may get hot-headed and emotional during the race, but he doesn't let it affect the end result. See the November race with Ross Chastain. I think if Gibbs finds his way to victory lane, which Harvick and many others believe will happen in 2024, his antics over the radio will soon be forgotten. Until then, he'll just continue providing content, and I'm very grateful for that. The story from Phoenix, and deservedly so, will be the strength of the Toyotas with Bell's win and the stage wins. But don't sleep on what the Fords did at the end of the 312 miles, with Busher finishing second and his boss, Brad Kozlowski, finishing fourth. Guess who finished fifth? Blaney. That's three out of the first four races in 2024 that the number 12 has finished inside the top five including the second place photo finish to Daniel Suarez at Atlanta a couple of weeks ago. But what's more impressive about Blaney is what he's done over the last 10 races dating back to last year's playoff race at Talladega, where he won. In that 10 race span, the 30-year-old has finished inside the top 10 eight times, but even more impressively, inside the top five on seven of them. What makes it all the more fascinating is to think back to what Kyle Petty said a year ago this past week about the Team Penske driver after the race in Las Vegas. Here's a little reminder. Look at Joey and Ryan, Ryan uh, Blaney. Um, and you know, for me, and, and I'm gonna be honest, man, Ryan Blaney uh, is the new Casey Kane, potential unfulfilled. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody wants yeah. to talk about what he can do, but he never does anything. You know what I mean? For whatever reason. For whatever reason, he just never gets past that hump. Oh, what a difference a year makes. And our final item is a follow-up on a video I did a few weeks ago, after Atlanta. When I decided to go back and do a little research on last year and what the points look like after the first two races of the season to see what it might tell us about who makes the playoffs. The data revealed that the top 16 in driver points after the second race last year looked very similar to the start of the 2023 playoffs. There were four drivers, Alex Bowman, Daniel Suarez, Corey LaJoy, and Chase Elliott that were inside the top 16 that didn't make the playoffs. Those spots were eventually filled by William Byron, Kyle Larson, Tyler Reddick, and Bubba Wallace. Now, four races in and another glance back at 2023, and that number had narrowed down to just two drivers who were inside the top 16 that didn't make the postseason last year. Alex Bowman, who was leading the points after the fourth race, missed the postseason after he broke his back during a midweek race and never seemed to recover. Daniel Suarez's struggles were well documented in 2023, but through four races, he was 11th in the points. Bowman and Suarez were eventually replaced by race winners Michael McDowell and Tyler Reddick. But this year, the top 16 still has four drivers inside it that didn't make the 2023 playoffs, including Chase Elliott in ninth, 
Daniel Suarez in 10th. We know he's locked in with his Atlanta win. Bowman 13th. And the biggest surprise in Penske driver Austin Sendrick sitting 15th. What's shocking is where his teammate Joey Logano sits after four races. 30th. Yes, the two-time champion has three finishes of 28th or worse. Ouch. It'll be interesting to see what the playoffs look like at the end of this year and how close will it look to the point standings from the first four weeks. We shall see. All right, guys, that'll do it for this episode. I want to get your thoughts on a variety of topics, including what the drivers and Kevin Harvick had to say before the race. Who do you agree with? And what did you think of the race? Did you expect Noah Gregson to have this good of a run with SHR to start 2024? What did you think about Harvick's remarks on Gibbs and what Gibbs had to say about Blaney? And if you're a Hendrick Motorsports fan, what are you thinking today with Kyle Larson the best finisher at 14th and the rest of the team finishing 18th through 20th? Remember, if you want to see my written work, go check out my stories at heavy.com. Also, don't forget to sign up for my weekly email newsletter at beatenandbangin.com where you'll get the latest news in your inbox every Friday, recapping the week's top stories, including any news items dropped during the various NASCAR-related podcasts. Appreciate you guys supporting the channel. Thanks as always, and have a great rest of your day.